all the people here. Uh, it's our own audience. Everybody knows uh, Daniel quite well. He's already uh, made a huge mark in this community <coughs> since I arrived here just last fall. Uh, but let me also go back and tell you some things about Daniel because I have some personal recollections about him since uh, I was a member of the search committee uh, headed by Rhonda that hired Daniel for MNTC position. And I was the person who was tasked uh, to find out more about Daniel. And those of you who know me know that I come from a somewhat different paradigm. So uh, this was interesting. Uh, so uh, let me also uh, talk about the outcome of this too, OK? So just to give a little bit of background of this. Uh, so there are certain things that just stick out in my mind. I had a really long, uh, detailed conversation with Daniel. And I remember, do you remember this? He uh, told me that he's a cultural historian. I said, what the hell are we getting into this? <laughs> he said, he's a cultural historian. And then he says, I study sociology, and then I study communication over time, and changes of technology, and all that. And I said, Christ. <laughs> I'm wasting my time talking to this person. I started telling a little bit more about his dissertation, and then I just found it to be amazingly fascinating. Um, and I come from a very different paradigm, but it's so humbling to learn about uh, your own limitations and how little you know. And it just was just fantastic just listening to his elaboration of what he was trying to uncover in his dissertation, uh, which he had finished because at that point in time, uh, he was a postdoc student at Yale. And he was also a fellow of the Information Society project where he was doing some really interesting work on uh, technology and privacy, new media and society. Um, so um, then he uh, told me a little bit about his uh, dissertation where I'll confess, initially it was more like academic interest, and I said I have to be dutiful to the context of the search, so I had to find out what it is. But then uh, it just struck me in terms of how uh, his dissertation was moving uh, beyond just situating it within the context of political movements, but looking at it uh, so much more from the classical literature and social movements. And even to a greenhorn like myself, who's not really embedded within that, uh, that was something which was just so transparent. Um, and um, then, you know, we started talking a little bit more, and uh, I just found it to be absolutely fascinating in terms of uh, the richness with which he was examining some of these uh, sociological t uh, changes um, uh, within the context of political movements and new media. And um, um, I think there was a definite, um, um, you know, I, I would like to think about this in terms of, I think he mentioned this phrase, but then I also like to think that I sort of had something to do with that too. Um, it, there was a, a, a techno-political utopian rigor or rhetoric to that. And uh, what, you know, I, I would like to think of that as uh, meaning that, um, you know, it goes beyond just looking at the context of the internet um, in, in a very simplistic sense, but looking at all the complexities um, which are unfolding when you look at it in terms of how it affects uh, the political playing field. And uh, this was something which was also uh, supported by, uh, when I spoke later to Daniel's advisor, Fred Turner at Stanford. Um, there was one phrase which he said which still stands out. He said, you know, uh, Daniel's dissertation, uh, the, the enormous work done in this, um, is going to lead both scholars as well as policy makers to conclude that uh, the internet will not level the political field. I thought that was an enormous uh, statement for him to be making. Uh, it's also a superb example of some very sophisticated network analysis. Uh, because it integrates um, you know, both individuals as well as organizations within one single analysis. So it's just a marvelous example of some great methodology as well. Uh, another uh, way in which you can talk about the impact of this work is to think about it in terms of um, Cliff Nass um, in um, so, uh, such a big influence uh, in so many aspects of technology research. Uh, said, you know, he summarized most of Daniel's work by saying that uh, this has to be arguably one of the best examples um, of uh, the impact uh, of internet on society at any level. Um, so it's been really, really rich work, and uh, Dan has already crafted so many connections on campus with our own communities of interest, with um, SILS, with uh, the law school. And um, he's been, uh, he has a great publication record already, published in places like New Media and Society, uh, Critical Studies in Media Communication. And today, um, uh, he just was telling us that he's got us uh, the cover for his book, which is coming out in Oxford University Press. And he's going to be talking about aspects of his dissertation today, uh, also involved in the book, what he refers to as computational management of the Obama campaign. So, welcome. Thank you, Shri. Um, that was the nicest introduction I've ever received. Um, so, thank you again. Um, and I want to, to just pause and reflect a moment that the last time I, I talked 
uh, in front of faculty and students here, I was a job candidate in this room. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, it's, it's, I'm humbled that you all decided to bring me back. Um, and sorry that you made the mistake of bringing me back, uh, perhaps. But um, so here I am to talk again uh, about uh, my book. And what I wanted to do is go a little bit more narrowly and deeper into a different aspect of the Obama campaign. When I was here and talked about my research project, I talked more about the historical scope of the, of the, uh, of the book, which looks at changes in new media and political campaigning over much of the last decade. Um, but what I want to focus on today is really just drill down to look at the new managerial and data practices uh, of the 2008 Obama campaign. And I'm happy in the Q&A uh, to talk a little bit more in response to your questions about what's going on in this election. Um, you always need sort of a natural frame uh, and academic work being what it is. We're the only profession paid to think slowly. Um, so although we are four years out from 2008 here, I spent a lot of time thinking about 2008 in ways that I think gives us analytical insight on what's happening in 2012. And more importantly, its consequences for how we think about and structure democratic life. Um, so just real quick, this is an excerpt, uh, an excerpt from a larger uh, uh, historical argument that I make. But what I want to do today is, is four things in particular. First, um, I want to frame some of the paradigmatic literature on new media and political participation. Uh, and as Sri just mentioned, uh, really talk about uh, paradigmatic accounts of collective action and how individuals come together to take collective action in society. And there's obviously a lot of consequence for that for how we think about involvement in things like electoral participation. Um, the second thing that I want to do uh, is discuss my methods. Um, and not only because I'm teaching my qualitative methods class uh, now and have some of my students in the room, but more generally when I speak in front of an interdisciplinary uh, uh, and cross -methodol uh, methodology audience, what I want to really focus on here is how do I know what I say that I know? Uh, and hopefully justify uh, to you how I know what I'm claiming uh, that I know. So I think a lot about things like rigor and sampling and qualitative work. Uh, and then really I want to get to the empirical data here uh, and talk a little bit about the organizational context of new media use in the 2008 Obama campaign. And I want to talk about three things. The, the first is what I call computational management. Uh, and this was the notion that the campaign delegated much of its managerial, allocative, uh, messaging and design decisions to analysis of user data as they interacted with the campaign uh, new media. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more of what that means uh, later on and show you some examples of that. But this worked both as an internal management tool, so the campaign was able to allocate its resources effectively. Uh, for example, spending more money on doing things like engaging in email versus uh, online advertising, but also in external management control. So website optimization really made its way for the first time in politics uh, for the first time in 2008. Uh, and then how the campaign used data to manage its enormous field operations, really on a scale and to a degree of sophistication that we haven't seen before. And that was immensely consequential for the outcome of this election. Uh, field campaigns have grown in their importance, uh, and the Obama campaign orchestrated through its use of data and new media technologies, uh, certainly the largest, most distributed field, uh, field operations in American electoral history. Finally, I want to pull back a bit uh, and really get at the analytical side and talk about the role of new media tools, the role of data uh, in shaping collective action and hopefully give you and make an argument in relation to how we should think about collective action in a contemporary media environment that looks a lot different uh, than when scholars were writing 40, 50 years ago in relation to social movements. Okay. To start, there are a number of very paradigmatic accounts uh, of new media and politics uh, that are drawn from classic accounts of organizing collective action. And this is an interdisciplinary body of work that grows up out of sociology, political science, communication, and economics. Uh, Manker Olson is probably the most famous formulator here. Um, but essentially what Manker Olson argued was that the cost of uh, identifying supporters, mobilizing them, uh, coordinating their action and participating in action itself was really expensive. 
uh, 50 years ago. And to do that, you would need a large formal organization that could do things like print newsletters, uh, coordinate volunteers, create managerial structures to house people to take uh, uh, collective action in some way. At the foundation of new work is that changes in tools and information environments are driving these shifts in political practice. So as you all are familiar with, right, the cost of producing information now has essentially fallen to almost zero. You can just go and create a blog or a Facebook page right, that publicized everyone meet in a square at so and so time. Uh, and it's a way to sort of get your message out to theoretically uh, the entire world. Um, and then hopefully even the cost of producing that collective action would change. So it's not just about occupying physical space, which actually still is a large investment, but also you see this in terms of making phone calls to legislators online or circulating online petitions. What used to be really expensive in terms of resources and in terms of time, scholars argue this is generally falling. Uh, and enabling new forms of collective action. As part of this, scholars generally sort of take the assumption that technologies are just sort of out there for political organizations and political actors to appropriate as they need, uh, as they need to. So for example, Facebook exists as a tool that organizations can go out and make use of in some way. Um, and this generally tends to be the paradigm that scholars working in this, where technologies are exogenous to campaigns themselves, and they shape organizing forms. So Bruce Bimber, who's uh, a political scientist and has written the big book on this subject called Information in American Democracy, argues that new media technologies lower the costs of political organizations to identify and mobilize supporters, uh, to coordinate their action and to participate this. And then Bibra argues that what we see now is what he calls post-bureaucratic organizations, such as moveon.org, for example, right? Groups with a relatively flat structure um, who are able to very quickly mobilize thousands of individuals to do things like write emails to their Congress members or even get them out into the streets around particular campaigns. And you actually see this in the uh, most recent uh, debate over Planned Parenthood and its funding. Uh, there was enormous collective action, uh, particularly among allies uh, to the left, using online formats to do things like fundraising quickly for Planned Parenthood, et cetera. So the cost of doing this stuff has fallen and Bimber's arguing uh, that that's highly consequential. As a corollary to that, collective action in this view is increasingly taking shape outside of formal organizational structures, right? So it's a lot more easy now to, on your own, convene people around a Facebook page uh, or a Facebook cause to take action in some way. So you don't necessarily need the large calcified bureaucracy of the past. And then more normatively, we see a number of recent scholars argue that electoral politics increasingly entails leveled collaboration and undermines elites in some way, right? Sort of a, a, a real nice notion of participatory democracy. Now, how does this map onto electoral politics? Certainly, in a lot of scholarly and more popular understanding, right, the Obama campaign is, is considered a vast social movement, right? It was people who just used the campaign's tools, they gathered, they took action, they self organized for themselves uh, in some way uh, electorally, and that fueled Obama's victory. Now, what was interesting to me as a scholar of electoral politics. Um, when I came to this project is that most of, most of my understanding of campaigns is that this story seemed a little too neat. It seemed a little too easy to call Obama's campaign a large distributed self-organized social movement in a way. And originally the book rose out of my time when I was trying to understand what happened to the Dean campaign four years earlier. And one of the things that I kept circling around there was that it did seem that a lot of the story of the Dean campaign fit this view that the scholars that I just talked about uh, were looking at. Lots of people taking independent actions on behalf of the campaign and doing so in powerful ways that might have raised a lot of money. But I was also on the ground in Sioux City, Iowa during the Iowa caucuses. And what did I see? I saw a real lack of organization uh, as undermining collective action in that case and context. And then when I started to match my experiences with what I saw going on with Dean, with talking to people who later went on to, talk to, uh, to work for the Obama campaign, they kept bringing up at how much the Obama campaign organization developed new means of coordinating all these people who are outside the campaign. 
So that is really the puzzle that I want to talk about today. How can and how did the Obama campaign develop new ways of convening all this collective action that was taking shape outside of the campaign on blogs uh, and using the campaign's tools? So ultimately, it became a study of what collective action looks like in a radically new information environment. And specifically, I was concerned with how organizations can coordinate the labor of such a diffuse and new volunteer base uh, that we saw in Obama's campaign. OK, so how did I get uh, to, to what I'm about to talk about in terms of empirically? Um, I took a threefold approach. In the literature I cited above, there tends to not be a lot of work that looks at how organizations actually function. So there tends to be a, very much a focus on users of media, but very little on the producers of media. So I wanted to treat the Obama campaign as a site of media production, to look at what folks were doing uh, actually within their organization and on the ground. So I did a couple things. Um, first, I conducted open-ended, average, about two and a half hour long interviews uh, uh, for the book with over 60 political staffers who are active across 2000, 2004, and 2008 campaigns, uh, including all the major presidential campaigns of, of those cycles. Um, that gave me some nice comparative data that I can talk about more in the Q&A later on uh, today. But so what I did for this, what I'll present today, was I purposely selected on the basis of Federal Election Commission filings um, people to interview who worked on the Obama campaign. So FEC pr uh, provides a list of uh, organizational charts and organizational disbursements, which enables me to map the what the organization of the Obama campaign looked like. So what I wanted to do is then interview all the relevant people within the Obama campaign's new media division. And this netted me 21 staffers and vendors to the campaign. Um, I supplemented that with some snowball sampling. So if I were to ask, as we know from the organizational literature, organization charts don't always look like how people actually work. Um, and you can think about that in your own lives. You're constantly collaborating with people who might not show up on a document somewhere. So I did some snowball sampling. I just asked people, uh, who did you work with on a regular basis? And can you put me in touch with them uh, if they were relevant? Of this 21, uh, I talked to two senior campaign staff, the director of new media, uh, for the campaign, uh, Joe Rospers, and the chief technology officer for the campaign. Both of these guys are now in senior roles on the re-election bid uh, as well. So uh, th there's, I can talk more about that later on, of how their practice here informs what's going on now. Uh, within that, I interviewed six of the eight department heads uh, on, uh, on the campaign. Uh, and I'll show the organizational chart in a, in a minute of what the um, what the new media division looked like, but I spoke to six of the senior staff, the senior department heads within that division. And then I, I spoke to a number of lower level staffers and vendors, so the, the folks who were not management but who were working within the new media division. <coughs> now that gives me a nice organizational story of how they perform their work. But I wanted to supplement that uh, with some participant observation because a lot of times what happens in headquarters in Chicago might look very different than what's going on on the ground. So I wanted that sort of bird's eye look. Uh, I should say the interviews were actually conducted after the campaign. Uh, I know of no researcher who's able to get uh, access to, to subjects during a campaign. Uh, if you know of anyone, please let me know, but it's impossible to get in touch with anyone while they're running a presidential bid. Um, so I talked to them afterwards about their experiences in the, in the months, most of them in the months immediately following. So for my participant observation, I spent three months as a precinct captain in San Francisco. This is important because a lot of what I'm going to talk about shows how data flowed between Chicago and places like San Francisco. In fact, the key to understanding the Obama campaign is the key to understanding how data and databases connect different sites uh, and enable the headquarters to manage what their operation looked like. I supplemented that with one month as a virtual precinct captain in Laredo, Texas. Uh, that gave me a nice comparison because I was able to call into a place and do phone-based canvassing. Uh, and then finally, I spent two weeks in Washoe County, uh, which Joe Bob knows what city is in Washoe County. Reno. Uh, so I spent two weeks in Nevada during the general election campaign. Um, and that was an electorally contested county, and that's why I chose it. Um, both the McCain and the Obama campaigns felt that winning the state of Nevada would come down to the swing 
of, of counties such as, as Washaw. Uh, so I spent two weeks on the ground with folks who were going door to door. Um, and that enabled me also to talk to some of the McCain folks um, because bars are nonpartisan in Reno, Nevada. Um, and then just looked at documents and databases. I'll present a little bit more about that later on. Primary documents that the campaign produced, um, uh, as well as, as, as databases like the FEC, enabled me to actually track vendors and consultants, et cetera, to the campaign in some interesting ways. Okay. I want to start now by talking a bit about the organizational context of new media use. Uh, on the Obama campaign and how the campaign organized its use of, of media and data. I think it's important to start, though, with this quote. And, th and this comes from Michael Slaby, the campaign's chief technology officer. Um, what's interesting and in th that was sort of echoed by staffers is that the story of Obama's success was not that new media alone drove the campaign and drove the election although there are a lot of accounts that seem to presume that it's just that technological change that drives a campaign like Obama's. Uh, and there tends to be sort of this notion that Obama had the coolest tools. I think that's wrong. I think what Slaby and other people were arguing is that what new media tools did really well was translate all this energy and interest in Obama as a candidate into the concrete electoral resources that the campaign really needed. And for a presidential campaign, that's ultimately money, message, and votes. Uh, and that was something that the Dean campaign didn't quite have in place, that translation of energy and interest into votes. So one of the ways that they did this is, is what I refer to here as computational management. And, and here's the, um, I guess there's nine department heads. Uh, here's what the new media department looked like. Um, if, if you can see that, there's folks developed. These are all the major areas of what a new media campaign practice would look like. Design, analytics, uh, video, social networks. And this, is, this chart is borrowed from the, the director of design um, who, who uh, uh, speaks about the organization of the new media campaign. Uh, but more generally, computational management is, is on one level an internal management tool. And it was the idea that the, the division developed a general data-driven mode of work, and it permeated the entire new media uh, division. And what the campaign tried to do as much as possible was delegate allocative and managerial and messaging and design decisions to the constant stream of data that was coming in as users were interacting with the campaign's multiple tools. So, for instance, the campaign developed a set of very clear goals uh, or outcomes that it desired, say in terms of fundraising or in terms of the reach of any particular message. Uh, and it tracked its effectiveness of meeting those, goal, those goals down to the minute and down to the penny. Um, comparing internally, for example, where allocating additional dollars uh, would benefit to the campaign. So they were constantly looking for, uh, which was a, a uh, much echoed term when I talk to folks, returns on investment. So they wanted to know what the invest, the return would be for every investment in any new media expenditure in terms of this efficiency of meeting their, their resource needs. So for example, the campaign would use a return on investment calculation to decide whether hiring an additional staffer or spending that additional money on more finely targeting emails would net additional money to the campaign. They were constantly making decisions such as this. As one staffer put it, we knew the exact dollar uh, amount to the penny, what a new email address would net for the campaign, less the cost of acquiring it. That was the level these guys were working on in terms of crunching data. So when we think about this, we can think about this in terms of, right, this notion of using data as an internal management tool to really evaluate all staffing and resource allocation decisions. And I could talk a little bit more about why the Obama campaign developed this ethos, but it sort of comes from very early on seeing themselves as running an insurgent campaign and very much needing to maximize and justify all of its resources. The new media division, I think, both because data is far more readily available when you get online and you can actually look at things like click-throughs on websites, um, uh, so you both have more data, but there was also an ethos that pervaded the campaign of looking very heavily at numbers and metrics with respect to these particular goals. 
So let me just talk for a minute about how computational management also extended to this notion of the campaign's external work with supporters. Um, one of the things that the campaign would uh, strive to do was probabilistically increase the likelihood that you would take the particular action that uh, the campaign wanted you to take for the campaign. Now, optimization uh, is well known in the industry. Every major company uses this. This is not necessarily a new thing. It was new in politics in 2008. And indeed, uh, the director of analytics came from Google. Uh, he was one of the developers on the Chrome browser. And that's another story of the Obama campaign that I can't get to now. But there's considerable movements from the technology industry to the Obama campaign. And that was one source of their innovation. Coincidentally, that happened on the Dean campaign campaign too. It seems that innovation is a story of staffers moving between professional fields in some senses. But in any event, everything that you saw was geared to you to increase your likelihood that you would take the action the campaign wanted you to take. So let me say a little bit more about this. Um, everything that you see here, from the photograph of the family, uh, to the word change, to that it's up in all capital letters, to this saying learn more, to this being red, to this being square, was all tested in large scale experimental trials that they continually ran uh, by showing this page to thousands and thousands of individuals and then tweaking just certain aspects of it, right? To try to increase the likelihood that they would get more people to sign up for their email address. And they did this throughout the campaign, but even more importantly, they did this geared to you and what they knew about you as a user. So this is uh, the back end. This is the proposed <coughs> and ultimately the implemented change to their splash page, which we were just looking at. So you could see what they knew about you. So they knew based on cookies, whether you had visited the site previously, whether you had signed up, whether you had made a donation, ordered a t-shirt, or created an account on their social networking platform. And then your geolocation. Do you live in a congressional district that votes strong Democratic, strong Republican, leaning Democratic, leaning Republican, or battleground? Right? So matching your prior history with them to where you live, and that's synced to voter data, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, and then showing you different content and different appeals on the basis of what they knew about you. So they would ask you different things. On one level, this is sort of obvious, right? So if you had visited the site previously and given your email address, there's no point to ask you again to sign up, right? You're already there. So what they wanted then is sort of move you up this ladder of engagement. So if you're on the email list but haven't made a, a donation, well, then they want you to make a donation of $15, a small amount. And these were more finely calibrated uh, for different categories of users. Um, or they want you to sort of move you into, particularly if you're in battleground states or contested states, uh, to use their voter registration tool to make sure that you're, you're uh, signed up and registered to vote. The point is, is that based on what they knew about you, they were finely tailoring their different appeals. And indeed, one of the things that was really interesting in talking to people is how much additional, this raised millions of additional dollars in these small little tweaks of, of content and design. Um, and they were continually, and I can't stress this enough, uh, devoting staffers to running these experimental trials in much the same way that the Huffington Post now constantly tests different configurations of its homepage to figure out how to get more hits uh, to its different articles and to maximize that to maximize ad revenue. Essentially, the Obama campaign was doing this to maximize in some way these electoral resources, right? Whether it's about volunteerism or whether it's about fundraising. Now, the big area I think that we're sort of going in uh, as a campaign, uh, in terms of campaigning, is that digital media offer more control over the classic field campaign process uh, and enabled the Obama campaign both to scale to a degree that we haven't seen before, um, although Barry Goldwater's campaign came close in terms of mobilizing volunteers, uh, but also much more effectively and efficiently coordinate their labor in real time and real space. Um, this is an example of the canvassing technology that was developed by the Democratic Party and used by the Obama campaign. I tell the story in the book of the development of these systems. Uh, Howard Dean, as chairman, really put these into place. Uh, and it's a fascinating story in its own right. Um, but more generally, what you see here are different targeted individuals uh, plotted onto a neighborhood map. 
And the technology that goes into targeting particular individuals is really difficult. And it has been the result of years of refining voter modeling. But just to give you a sense of how this works, um, essentially, the, in the voter database, uh, the parties start with public information. Um, so whether you're registered to vote, which party you're registered to vote for, uh, your real estate transactions, what kind of car you drive, right? So when you sign up at the DMV. They then add to that commercial data. So things like, and, and students I've had before have heard me talk about this, if you have a grocery club card, for example, right, that data gets sold off to third parties and makes its way into a campaign database eventually. Um, credit card firms sell data on their users. Um, so something like, and, and uh, the private firm Catalyst has about 480 discrete pieces of information on every member of the electorate in some way. So all this data gets aggregated. The third big piece of data, and, and this is important, uh, is canvassing. So Obama sent millions of people into the field to knock on people's doors during the 2008 uh, campaign. What's important uh, is that all of that information that the campaign produced gets stored into a database and is available to the Obama campaign in 2012. So when folks show up at your door, they ask you who you're planning on voting for, whether you're registered to vote. They might ask you what issues are important to you. Uh, all that information gets collected and stored in some real way. And now there's applications for these things on iPhones. So it's much easier to enter that data uh, in a real way. OK. Now, what happens uh, is once you have all this data, the problem for much of the last decade was that none of it was meaningful. So campaign consultants would often think about, oh, we have you know, a suburban female uh, a professional woman who was in her 40s and had two kids and ate arugula on the weekend, et cetera. But none of it was ever tied to a model of who that person actually voted for. So essentially, <coughs> what happens is that uh, the Obama campaign contracted out with an outside firm, and now this is common, they do a, a poll of the entire electorate, and they figure out who are, um, who are people likely to be supporting? And how uh, close are they to fitting, uh, to being a strong Obama supporter, a weak Obama supporter, truly undecided, or leaning towards the other candidate? And what they do then is then work backwards. So they figure out what are all the variables of Obama supporters. They look for correlations. And then what they do is lay that over the voter database that they have over the entire electorate. And from there, the Obama campaign scored, uh, scored a number between 0 and 100 for every member of the electorate as to how likely you would be to be supporting Obama. Um, it's proprietary information how all these things work. This is what I was able to find out and, and gather. Um, but more generally, when you were uh, on the ground, on the field, you would see a particular score. And then the field campaign would target the electorate based on where that score was. The priorities for campaigns. Uh, are really finding those who already support you. So because you want to turn them out and vote early is, is a new big aspect of, of campaign practice. <coughs> so you want to get them mobilized. Um, and then finding the, the persuadables, right? That group of people who are either truly on the fence uh, or leaning in your direction to try to convince them to come over to your side. If you have extra time and money to burn, then you reach out to the people who are leaning in the other direction but primarily you focus on those people you can get um, and you ignore the rest. So campaigns don't want to talk to uh, people who aren't modeled to be fitting with that. And that often, I do have to say, going door to door sometimes produces cognitive dissonance because you'll get uh, a walk sheet that tells you to contact this person, but you might run into their husband. And campaigns tell you, you don't talk to their husband. That's not important. You can only talk to, to the wife. Um, and volunteers, and, and Rasmus Nielsen, actually, who will be here in, in, in April uh, to give a special talk, just wrote a whole book about ground campaigning that talks a lot about the human aspect of how this works and how human beings manage sort of the work of technical systems. Um, so I'm excited to have him here. He's a good friend, and our books complement each other in a lot of ways. OK. Now, what was key here, right, is that the campaign was much more easily able to plot and deploy volunteers in real space, right? In the old days, you used to have to do all this stuff by hand. 
And when I say the old days, 2004, you would map quest voters. So these poor harried field staffers, right? Talk about information costs being lowered. Uh, so these poor harried voters used to have to plot every address into MapQuest and print out those sheets and hand a stack of them to their volunteers. Now, through things like Google Maps, you can plot everyone at once and create a nice convenient walk list. Before that, everyone was just on index cards and you sort of just walked through a neighborhood and figured out where you needed to go. A key innovation in 2008 on the Obama campaign was blending and syncing its voter file with its online systems to be able to uh, uh, enable its volunteers to directly contact voters. So they actually didn't have to go to a, a, an office anymore. They could call from their own homes. And they would get a script, and there would be a data entry function, and that was synced back to the database. This is something that didn't work great in 2008. There was a whole host of complicated reasons why. Um, but by 2012, it will be a much more robust system. But th there's a couple of keys here. What's nice is that this enables now the campaign to produce much more finely targeted scripts to voters. So based on what they know about you, uh, they can appeal to your particular interests, right? Uh, at the same time, one of the big challenges of running a large-scale volunteer operation is that the quality of the data is often really bad. People scribble in the margins. People who talk are like, uh, he's kind of supporting Obama, but not really ready to commit. What do you do? Most of the times, volunteers just come up with workarounds and check not at home after they had the conversation. It drives campaigns mad, right? Because if they don't have good data, uh, they can't figure out how to allocate their resources or what their numbers are, so the metrics games. One of the things that this system enables you to do in some way is automate the data entry, so you strip out that extraneous information. There's still workarounds and they're still guessing, uh, but it improves the data collection and makes it instantaneous. And it's very important for a field campaign that, again, is generating its numbers in terms of its goals so closely calibrated down to the minute, right? The important thing uh, is that this system now enables us to imagine a much more distributed field operation uh, like what the Obama campaign put together in 2008. So just to walk you through the way the chain looks here. So a supporter in California, right, might get a recruiting email or a text message from campaign headquarters. So a supporter who already signed up, maybe they're a weak Obama supporter, uh, might get a nice finely crafted email that's been tested, uh, 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 urging them to call voters in Nevada in advance of the general election. Uh, that supporter who has a soft heart and wants to see Obama win, right, can log into mybrockobama.com, uh, can call, start calling voters in Nevada right away, and enter that information into the campaign's database. Now, what's fascinating about this is that campaign headquarters can monitor those vote calls, and the field organizer in Nevada can monitor those vote calls. So let's say the supporter's entering that information, they're realizing, well, here's a voter who's an Obama supporter but hasn't turned out to vote yet. Well, then the field organizer in Nevada can say, I'm going to deploy some field volunteers to go show up at their door and to say, kindly, uh, please go vote, which is often what happened, right? Because they wanted people to vote as early as possible. The campaign headquarters, meanwhile, can constantly monitor what's going on here and what's going on on the ground. So the, the notion of data management becomes much more important these computer terminals in these databases provide this real-time look at the, uh, at the electorate, uh, where people are likely, what sort of numbers they have, where they need to allocate uh, other resources. And I should say, too, is that it's not just about how many people are turning out to vote earlier, although this is important and a growing phenomenon within campaigning, um, but also where to send the candidate. Right? If the candidate is needed in a particular county, right? say the early vote totals are low, they can dispatch Obama to go there and hopefully drum up some local television interest uh, uh, and then put it, on the, um, put it on the local news so that more voters are reminded that they actually have to go and vote. Uh, so this informs campaign strategy in a new way, I would argue. Okay. Now, what does all of this say uh, really for how we should think about collective action in the electoral space. And I'm happy to talk about 
why our institutional version of electoral politics might look different than some social movement organizing, uh, like Occupy Wall Street or like the Arab Spring. Uh, there are real differences there. I think electoral institutions shape how new media gets adopted in very real and, and important ways. But I want to tell a bit of a story here about how tools and data, what I was just talking about, provide new means of coordinating collective action in lieu of formal managerial structures and relationships. Essentially, we could think about this as the, the dean problem in a way, right? Lots of volunteers, lots of people energized and engaged, but outside of the boundaries of the formal campaign organization, and therefore, they need to be coordinated in some way. So how do you do it? Well, one way the Obama campaign did it uh, is sort of what I call the delegation of authority to structured interactivity, right? What I mean by structured interactivity is simply, it's the idea that when you put tools out there for supporters to use, you build in certain features, certain ways to be interactive, but not others. It's not like Obama volunteers were going to mybrockobama.com to contribute their policy ideas. There was no one on the other end of the line. That just wasn't important for the campaign. Uh, but what they did want you to do is raise money for the campaign, right? It was very easy to donate. Uh, it was very easy to make phone calls to contact undecided voters. So when we think about interactivity, we can think about interactivity as being structured through design decisions. Programmers have certain goals. Uh, for how they want to build their tools. And one of the ways that you get people doing what you want them to do is to provide them th with tools that make it easier in that way. Uh, the Dean campaign sort of came to this pretty late. They had a lot of things that weren't always tied to their electoral goals. I think the Obama campaign did it much better, was to think about how to use design as a management tool in some way to these people who exist uh, outside of your formal campaign organization. The second is sort of obvious, but it's, it's worth talking a bit about, uh, is that data is central to facilitating control and coordination. Um, there seems to be, I think, within the literature, uh, uh, a missing piece. Uh, it exists in privacy literature, but we don't really have a great understanding of how organizations like campaigns use data. Uh, and increasingly, I would say this should be on a research agenda for people who study journalism. Uh, Data-driven stories, getting paid based on hits. Uh, I was just talking to uh, a woman who um, wrote for Politico who said that they have, um, I think it was Politico, it might have been a different outlet, they have a counter of how much uh, it was, uh, it wasn't Politico, it was Forbes, uh, they, were, they had a real-time counter of how many hits their stories were getting. Does that change the nature of the relationship between the journalist and his or her public? Does it change what they write or how they conceive their public? In the same way, I would argue that thinking about data in this way changes subtly this notion of how campaigns think about voters uh, in a way. And data facilitates control and coordination. It becomes much easier for campaigns to manage voters uh, across distributed distance uh, and in real time and in real space, down to the notion that you're actually actively tailoring content in ways that in the aggregate uh, is increasing the returns on investment that you're looking to get. At the same time, I think one of the arguments here is that organizational contexts of new media use continue to be really important. So if sort of the first generation of literature that really looked at the internet and collective action sort of framed formal organizations as being relatively unimportant, now I would argue we should rethink that and bring them back in in a big way. And indeed, one of the interesting things I had um, uh, a guest speaker in my introduction political communication class this morning uh, who was working on the anti-amendment campaign talked a bit about how Planned Parenthood, their role in the most recent um, uh, foundation incident was actually to provide and to, to do things like buy advertising on Twitter to keep the controversy going, to speak with their membership to get them activated and mobilized. So organizations, that's a formal organization that still plays a coordinating role. Uh, even though social media provide more people with opportunities to participate, that doesn't necessarily mean that organizations are not important. And I would argue, formal organizations such as the Obama campaign, again, can do very well in translating this interest and desire into actions that it wants people to take. <coughs> My final piece, and then I'll, I will wrap up, because it's been about 45 minutes, um, is really something that I've been trying to think about a little bit uh, more, um, and this is sort of 
pushing on more of the speculative, uh, I was encouraged to think about presenting new work, and I'm working on a piece um, that tries to get at more generally how the role of data in campaigns and algorithms in campaigns, whether it's voter modeling algorithms or uh, whether it's targeting algorithms, et cetera, are shaping in some way the very conduct of, of democratic politics. So what I want to think about here is how we go from campaigns being much more about sort of this tacit knowledge that was an apprenticeship system, right? To learn how to do a campaign, you went and spent time working with folks who had done it before. Uh, and it was much more of this, this idea where you learned by doing and you learned sort of the, the ticks of the trade or the tricks of the trade. It, practice was relying on skill and political instinct. You just sort of knew what worked, right, in some way. Uh, and in a sense, this is a very old idea, right? So if we think historically about American electoral politics, we went from an era of strong party politics, which lasted until about the middle of the, the 20th century, where politics was organized by having local ward bosses or local precinct bosses, uh, who in some ways, right, had a very detailed knowledge of everyone who lived there. And it was very much an idea, it was a, 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 a a practice that was premised on human relationships in some way. And then we moved to a much more candidate-centric politics after the 1960s uh, in the wake of electoral forums, et cetera, and the rise of more candidate-centric politics. And partially with that shift, candidates moved to doing things like uh, engaging in much more mass media campaigns once we moved to open primaries. There's a whole body of literature that looks at the consequence of electoral reform. But what I want to just point out here and suggest perhaps that even though political marketers have long been interested in voter data, for example, and there's long been very specialized uh, uh, campaign practices, that much more data-driven processes are now permeating campaigns to a much greater extent than before. For. Um, and I would argue that data-driven processes, just as we see, I think, similar shifts in journalism, are now reshaping the routine functioning of these organizations in ways that they didn't before. Uh, and capacities for things like real-time management uh, of, of voter data or of field campaigning or of online advertising uh, is sort of displacing what was this older, more tacit knowledge that comes from an older model, perhaps, of practicing politics. Uh, again, that work is sort of in progress, is thinking about this larger historical shift. Um, but I will stop there with that and just take questions. <laughs> Thoughts, critiques, yeah. What uh, what analytic tools did they use on social media to to, to a look at what people were talking about and, and b uh, how did they evaluate effectiveness when they were you know obviously soliciting people via, via social media and trying to yeah you know it was that it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, the role of Twitter in this in two thousand eight was just not yeah. Uh, and even Facebook, the, the big takeaway that I had from Facebook was that they actually had organizers who uh, monitored Facebook groups that the campaign set up. So I can give you a canonical story of this. Uh, Chris Hughes, who's a co-founder of Facebook and, and, and was working on the Obama campaign in advance of the Iowa caucuses, um, set up uh, Facebook groups for every high school in the state of Iowa uh, with his team. And essentially, they set up Facebook for the high school for Obama groups. Uh, and then once people joined them, they had organizers sitting in Iowa contact those people to get them out to regular field offices uh, and to translate them into volunteers. As far as I know, that was the general practice. It was a very human-based practice um, in terms of how they were monitoring their numbers coming on, uh, coming on the campaign through those social media sites. Again, I think that this probably looks a lot different now than it did in 2008. Uh, in 2008, it was still kind of new, um, but it was mostly used as sort of a classic field organizing tool uh, in that way. The other th way that they used you know, social media more generally was uh, uh, what Joe Rospers, who is the, the head of the New Media Division, described as setting up embassies all over the internet. So 
the, it was the idea that we have such a fragmented audience now and, and people inhabit such different media spheres um, that what the campaign wanted to do is just set up what they called embassies in every little place around the new media, social media planet. Uh, that would be Obama's representative there. Um, so, uh, for example, they would have a Facebook candidate profile and they would have a profile on Black Planet or, and pretty much every social network you could think about, they were on somewhere. And the idea is that was a messaging channel. Uh, they would often try to communicate with supporters through that. Um, but I think the, the, the metrics and the analytical tools I don't know about and I'm not sure, they never really were talked about. So my guess is that they probably just didn't exist. At that stage, yeah, I'd be very curious to see sort of what this looks like now. They work with Gina, but they're that much. That's why I asked you. I don't know when that relationship started. That's the official analytics source for Twitter. They have a partnership now. Now, yeah, so I don't. It, it wasn't around in 2008, at least that I ever, ever anybody ever mentioned. In fact. Ironically enough, when I was conducting these interviews, Twitter never really came up. And then it exploded afterwards, right? And so my guess is that it probably looks very different now. That yeah? In the, in the last uh, slide that you have, the last point that you made, so you were saying it was the old model and this is a, a new model. E, maybe, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. work in a transitional model, are you saying? Yeah. Um, the new model? Yeah, so here's what I'll say about the Obama campaign. Uh, it was certainly, it's, it's sort of, um, it was the most advanced case of this new model so far. I think it's where the industry is going, right? So, so the Obama campaign in 2008 is the widely accepted best practice on a whole host of levels. Um, it's what pro political professionals emulate. Um, I don't think there's any necessarily lo necessary logic to why campaigning has to look like this, other than that they were successful and everyone sort of looks to them as being uh, the model for how a good campaign should be run in new media. Yeah. Or did they lose it? Because it seems that the information that they are capturing is, is a lot of information that is very specific. Right, like what, what their interests are or what they're supported, supporting. Um, yeah, so the some estimates I've seen, uh, I, I hate to break information up like this, but 223 million pieces of discrete information about, about voters were collected through canvassing. Um, that all made its way into a database that is owned by the Democratic Party. Um, so that gets carried over now until 2012. Uh, there's an interesting story about Romney's campaign uh, did a very similar thing in Iowa where they saved all their voter contacts uh, from Iowa in 2008 during the primaries and checked in with people over four years and then went back to them. Uh, so they knew what their numbers were going in and they knew what they had to do in order to, to pull off a victory. And I don't know if they did or not, uh, whatever the Republican Party in Iowa decides. Um, but that was a great example. So this, this data is accrued and it's aggregated and it's carried over across elections. And that actually is, I'm glad you brought that up because that, that's something that I try to push back against in, in, in my book a lot is that a lot of the scholarship on this stuff just looks at discrete campaigns. And that's the wrong way to understand it. It's, it's not that campaigns just sort of comp out of nowhere every four years, right, on the presidential level. Um, midterm elections are important testing grounds. They're often the same people uh, uh, who do presidential runs. They test new tools, they test new strategies in between elections. Political parties provide infrastructure that get carried across election campaigns. Uh, so there's this whole world that exists even when journalists aren't paying attention to it. Uh, that's immensely important for the shape of the Obama campaign. You can't think about the Obama campaign in 2008 without understanding what the work of Dean's former staffers did between 2004 and 2008. And that's the larger argument of the book is that most of the models we have for thinking about politics is this weird discrete election cycle to election cycle thing. And then often, and then the corollary to that 
is that so much of the literature just focuses on what is political and what is commercial. But I think one of the interesting stories of the book is that those things are really jumbled up and practitioners themselves have no understanding of what's political and what's commercial. Because we have a world where people go from Google to the Obama campaign and then go back. So how do we think about that analytically, if not by thinking about things as being movement-based, moving across professional fields at different times? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be like a logical sort of? Well, there's rules about what you can do in governance versus what you can do in campaigning. Uh, you can't carry over data to the administration, for example. Uh, the data goes to the political arm of the party. Why not? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know the exact. Um, the exact law, but there's uh, there's law. It's administrative law, I believe, that that uh, makes sure that the political arm of campaigns and the governance arm for campaigns are separate and distinct, uh, and for good reason, right? Because you can imagine that if you've amassed a database and you know who all your supporters are and then who your enemies are, right? That you could just easily dole out political favors in some way. So those are kept very separate. Um, so most the data that I was talking about is in the Democratic Party and used for the campaign. Now, one of the things the Obama campaign did was try to set up Organizing for America, which was the um, uh, which was the idea that it would be an arm of the Democratic Party that would exist not in direct consultation with the White House, but would be aimed at advancing the president's legislative agenda. Um, and that had a lot of rocky moments for a number of different reasons. Uh, I would often let my interview um, recorder run after my conversations when, when folks who worked on the campaign talked a bit about the, um, the transition to governance, is that legislative agendas are a lot harder to mobilize people behind. Electoral politics gives you a clear outcome, right? Yes, we can. We need to put this man in office on November 5th, right? Whereas a legislative agenda involves more sausage making, horse trading with different congressional members. Uh, it's a far more messy complex uh, uh, and complicated process. What's a victory is not quite so clear anymore. Um, so they had a lot of issues with transitioning from this very mobilizational model to what you do when you're actually trying to govern. And indeed, the other thing is, is that the needs uh, and the desires of supporters in the post-election world often look different than the needs of the Democratic Party in the legislative world. So you saw this, if you remember Blanche Lincoln, uh, who was the uh, former uh, senator of Arkansas, um, was running for re-election. And the Organizing for America was supporting her re-election, whereas a lot of the people who were more progressive and had been Obama's strong supporters were supporting a primary challenger to her because she was too conservative. So Organizing for America was caught in this in-between position where it needed those former Obama supporters to be taking action with it, but Obama supporters had an entirely different sense of what their own political goals were in this, in this case. Uh, so in long answer to your question, Governance looks very different, uh, I think, on a number of different levels, not least of which is because there's a lot less energy mobilization and clear goals. Uh, the data certainly looks different. There are things that the party can do that, that the administration cannot do. Uh, and then more generally, supporters sort of have a life of their own in some ways. Yeah? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think this is where the Slaby quote that I presented earlier sort of really gets at this. It's, it's not like these tools themselves as infrastructure created the phenomenon that was, you know, millions of people who are really uh, supporting Obama. Uh, Ron Paul is a great example of someone who has a large base of support online um, uh, and is able to wield it effectively in some ways. So I think what you see is... Sure, there's a lot of money that goes into developing these sorts of things. And there's an incredible amount of money that gets invested into doing things like building databases for the party or hiring really talented staffers, people who know what they're doing. So there's that. 
Uh, but I think at one level, politics will always remain vulnerable to an outsider or insurgent candidate, in part because tools themselves and money themselves don't create this interest and desire, right, that Slaby was talking about. Uh, what they do really well is efficiently translating them into the only metrics that electoral institutions uh, really matter, and right, so that's money and, and votes ultimately. Um, but what they don't do is, even if Romney, for example, had the best infrastructure in the world, uh, I think Romney would be hard pressed of matching the mobilization around the Obama campaign in 2008. And indeed, I would venture to say you probably won't see a similar scale of mobilization around Obama's campaign in 2012. Uh, I'm open to being wrong about that. But more generally, it seems like it's not the tools themselves. Even if the tools get more sophisticated, it's, it's the political context. It's the moment, right? It's the rhetoric. It's the charisma. It's, it's all those more ineffable things that help shape the outcome of election campaigns. Uh, don't determine them, but they shape them. Uh, and they certainly shape mobilization and they shape energy. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I think Obama's campaign will try to very much portray the 2012 election as, as threatening uh, to undermine the progress of the last eight years. And we'll see if that becomes an effective, uh, effective tool. But really, it's best tools in the world. All the money in the world isn't necessarily going to determine what the outcome will be.